Dr. Ken Landau, thanks for watching. Let's talk about Cerevital. Cerevital is marketed by San Medica International. It's supposedly a fountain of youth pill that's going to be able to increase your own body's natural production of growth hormone. And obviously growth hormone sounds good, so you should have a lot of it, so they say. No injections, no artificial chemicals. It's all done through the natural ingredients in a Cerevital pill. The company says it's not a magic bullet, but it's part of a healthy lifestyle, you know, diet and exercise. You best take it on an empty stomach a couple hours before, a couple hours after you eat. An older individual needs more pills than a younger individual who's outside and active and exercising. For the average person, maybe two pills twice a day. Going to cost you about $100 a month, though. No insurance for this. $100 out of the pocket. But if you sign up for their automatic plan, they'll send you every single month, they'll send you another bottle, and they'll give you a break on the price. only charge you about $79. Material about the pill was presented at several medical meetings and in Parade Magazine on Fox and CNN. All Cerevital is is a combination, according to the company, a specific combination of some arginine, some lysine, some cysteine, some proline, and some glutamine. And if you take it in the particular dosage level that the company recommends, then only that product is going to really stimulate your body's natural production of growth hormone. The original abstract was so impressive, even Dr. Oz noted it. And what did the original abstract show? Well, it showed that if they took 16 otherwise healthy individuals, these people average age 32, weighed a little bit more than they should, but not much. They certainly weren't fat. If they took the single dose of Cerevital and they had their blood drawn, at 15 minutes, 30 minutes, 60, 90, 120 minutes afterward, it was found that at 120 minutes afterward, the HGH, human growth hormone level, increased eightfold, 682% increase. That sounds like it is fantastic, except it went from normal to normal. Actually, it was on the low side of normal. So it didn't really make these people have a lot of HGH in their body. It was actually barely detectable. Well, it's interesting that if you look at the group taking placebo, before they took the placebo, when they had their blood test drawn, their initial blood test, it was about the same as the people who took the Cerevital after they took the Cerevital. Well, how could it be a 682% increase or an eightfold increase if the placebo group started out basically at the same level as the Cerevital group rose to after they took the product. Doesn't make any sense. But you have to realize that growth hormone is secreted in phases. It's kind of like the waves. They come and they go, they come and they go. And there's so much overlap between normal, which is basically undetectable to just a little teeny weeny bit, that you really have to do either a suppression test or a stimulation test in order to find out what happens. And growth hormone level in your body is going to significantly change depending on your sleep. So we know that most of the growth hormone in the body in the course of a day is put out during your sleep, a couple hours after you go to sleep. And then actually 50% of it comes out in the later stages of non-REM sleep. It also significantly varies depending on your emotions, depending on your stress, your exercise level, your nutrition. We know the hypothalamus inside the brain makes two different kinds of chemicals. One that stimulates the release of growth hormone from the pituitary gland, also in your brain, and another substance that inhibits it. And it does this all during the course of the day. So normal levels in men are anywhere up to about five nanograms per milliliter in women, maybe six nanograms in kids. Could be up to as high as 20 nanograms. But if you really want to know what's happening with your growth hormone, you have to do a stimulation test. You give a person some arginine intravenously, not by mouth, but intravenously, or you give them some glucagon, or you give them some insulin, and then you follow what happens to the growth hormone level. And if you have a normal peak 
of more than 10 nanograms per milliliter, then you can say you were able to stimulate the body to produce the growth hormone. Is that what Sarah Vital did? No, it only went up to 1.33. So, well, maybe it's an intermediate level. No, intermediate level is defined as between 5 and 10 nanograms per milliliter. You mean that after you took the Cerevital, the thing that increases your growth hormone, it was subnormal? Yep, that's exactly what I mean. A subnormal stimulation test is when the human growth hormone goes up less than 5 nanograms, and that's where the Cerevital was. Well, actually, during the course of the day, the growth hormone level is basically undetectable. A single measurement or a series of measurements is useless in determining what your real level of growth hormone is. Mayo Clinic says it's totally worthless, a single test. What you really need to do is you go find what's happening to a different product, a product that HGH stimulates. That's called IGF-1. Now, supposedly HGH, growth hormone, is touted as a mechanism of making you look younger, feel younger. It's going to increase your lean body mass. It's going to decrease your fat. It's going to counteract obesity, get rid of your wrinkles, get rid of your saggy skin, tighten it up, give you some energy. It's going to increase your sex drive, and it's going to help with the wound healing and your mood, and it's going to combat anxiety. And low levels, on the other hand, are going to do everything that's bad. Low levels are supposedly going to increase your sensitivity to heat and the cold. It's going to cause you to have less muscle, more fat. It's going to have a decreased stamina associated with it, decreased strength, decreased ability to exercise. It's going to make your bones thinner. It's going to increase your risk of fractures. It's going to increase your cholesterol, increase your bad cholesterol, increase your triglycerides, and it's going to increase some clotting factors. And oh my goodness, it's going to impact on your psychological well-being going to impair your concentration, cause you to lose your memory, and even go bald. Oh my goodness. Well, actually, there's no science behind taking these HGH components between taking the amino acids and increasing your HGH level. Now, the normal function, normal function of growth hormone is to stimulate growth. Obviously, that's why they call it growth hormone. It increases sexual maturation, increases fertility, but it comes at significant cost in terms of making you older and decreasing your life expectancy. So over a period of time, natural decrease occurs. Yes, indeed, and some uh, loss of strength and vigor and vitality might occur. We don't know that it's really associated with the human growth hormone necessarily, but we do know that a lower level of growth hormone protects you against getting cancer and other neoplastic diseases. And as a matter of fact, animals, when studied in the laboratory, that have low levels of growth hormone or are resistant to the action of growth hormone, where they have a deficit of a receptor, they have a longer lifespan. Well, in a meta-analysis study of 18 studies that was done in 2007, it was found that recombinant HGH in the elderly individuals caused a small change in the body components, but it was also associated with an increased risk of adverse events, and it wasn't recommended. And we know with rapid growth, the HGH level, human growth hormone level, is going to increase. But as you reach maturity, it's going to stabilize and then decrease. And as it does, we call that the somatopause. Just like in women, when they lose the estrogen production, we call that the menopause. This is the somatopause. Well, during the somatopause, you're going to decrease your muscle, you're going to increase your fat, you're going to decrease your libido, decrease the exercise and the energy level but we don't know that the two are necessarily related. We do know that you can have a low level of growth hormone because you have certain kinds of tumors, but we usually can find the answer relatively quickly. Where did all of this start? It started with a Dr. Rudman back in 1990 who published an article. What he did was look at 12 otherwise healthy individuals, and these individuals were between the ages of 60 and 80 about. They had a low level of that IGF-1 that we talked about that HGH stimulates. And these people, over a period of six months, were given about twice the normal growth hormone level replacements. And what happened is, yes indeed, they gained muscle mass. Gained about 10 pounds of muscle. They lost about 8 pounds of fat. They increased their bone mineral density, but they didn't have any increase in strength. 
they didn't have any increase in endurance, and as a matter of fact, they had some side effects. They had an increased systolic blood pressure, an increase in their blood sugar. They had swelling of the hands and feet. They had arthralgias and joint pain, edema and headache. They had carpal tunnel syndrome, insulin resistance, possible onset of diabetes. They had, as I said, the mild hypertension. They had some visual problems. They had some nausea and vomiting. Another couple studies looked at older individuals, both men and women. And they found that, yes, indeed, if you give them growth hormone, you can get some changes in the body composition, but you don't change the strength and you don't change the body's ability to utilize oxygen. And in another very interesting study, what they did was they had people exercise, lift weights, do strength training, and indeed they found that they increased the strength. Then they gave them either the growth hormone or placebo, and they found that there wasn't any difference between the two groups. They increased when they exercised, the strength increased, but they didn't increase when they took the growth hormone or the placebo. And in one study, it looked at the rate of prostate cancer, and it found that in men who had the highest levels of the IGF-1, that's the thing that the growth hormone stimulates, well, those are the men that had the highest incidence of prostate cancer. It rose fourfold, and as a matter of fact, in laboratory studies where we look at animals that either are resistant to the action of growth hormone, we call these the Ron dwarfs, or who had low levels of growth hormone, they did indeed live about 25 to 60 percent longer. They had a decrease in their rate of aging. They maintained the youthful appearance. They had more vigor. They had more cognitive abilities for animals. And they had a decrease in the incidence and the frequency of malignant tumors. In children, too much growth hormone leads to a condition known as gigantism. In adults, it leads to a condition known as acromegaly. In both of these individuals, the children and the adults, excess levels of growth hormone lead to a decrease in life expectancy, an increase in cardiovascular disease, an increase in diabetes, and an increase in cancer. So the bottom line is, Cerevital sounds like it's an expensive placebo, it's marketed, it's hyped, but there's not a lot of scientific evidence to suggest that it's any good. And if it really is good, if it really increases your HGH level, it might actually be bad for you. So think about that. I'm Dr. Ken Landau. Thanks for watching.